All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Quarantine Sunday. And today we're going to talk about sanctification. And I know that this is a very common theme that we talk about, especially during quarantine, but it is in the text once again. Now, before that, I want to ask you guys a question. Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't know what to do to escape, so you lied? Have you ever been in a circumstance where you were so desperate for some sort of escape or relief that you do something you know is wrong just for the momentary relief? Now, that's something we're going to talk about, but we're going to go a little bit deeper into this and think of this sermon as a kind of like a a devotional application sort of a sermon. Okay, so without further ado, we go straight into the text. We're in Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 10. Now, this is a very familiar story to a lot of people. This is the story of Abraham going to Egypt, and then um, essentially he lied about his relationship with Sarai or Sarah. Now, before that, we have to take note of certain facts. If you notice, ever since uh, Adam, God made Adam and Eve, right? So ever since Adam, Adam failed as the first Adam and he was naked and ashamed. And then came Noah and Noah was also, in a sense, naked and uh, he was also shamed. And so we see the patriarchs and the flaws of the patriarchs and none of them is perfect. And they should not be anyway, because the true perfect savior is only Jesus Christ and him alone. So God always sends us these these kinds of archetypes to show us that as wonderful as these patriarchs are, and later on, even in through the Old Testament, through the prophets and the kings with King David, as a man after God's own heart, we still see that he sinned, that he's not perfect, because Christ is our only example of the perfection of holiness. Now, why do we bring that up? Because Abraham here is about to show a very, very bad character flaw, Okay. And something that we have to remember at the outset is this. Partial obedience is still disobedience. I'll say that again. Partial obedience is still disobedience. A compromise here, a bending of the rules there, and eventually people will fall into sin. We'll always think that way of sin. It's always the same thing. It's always, oh, you know, this is so small. It's probably going to be nothing. It won't mean anything. But then that sin, it will grow. It will balloon. And then later on when it pops, it's not going to be a cute balloon pop. It's going to be an explosion of disaster. All right? So if you guys um, think of the commercial, great things start from small beginnings. So if you think of Milo, think of sin or sinful Milo. All right? So Genesis 12 verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Now pause for a moment. This I find very, very ironic and humorous at the same time, and here's why. Abraham was already in the promised land. He was in Canaan. And remember what God said, go to this land I'm going to show you and I'm going to bless you there. Imagine Abraham's surprise. He gets to the, to the promised land and then famine. What happened to God's blessing? If you put yourself in his shoes, how would you feel? Abraham, he left his family, his home, his country, every source of security. Remember last week, every source of security he left. He obeyed God in all areas of his life. And his obedience led him straight into a trial. Now, if you think about it, the land of Ur was near the Euphrates River. That means it was fruitful. Vegetation was great. Animals were abundant. There was a good source of water. It was a rich area. And it's very possible Abraham never experienced famine before. And then suddenly, he goes to the promised land and he's expecting it to be greater than the land of Ur. And he experiences famine. What did Abraham do? Suddenly, he stopped building altars as reminders of God's faithfulness. He stopped thinking of the promises of God. He leaves the promised land and goes to Egypt. Now that's very telling about him and about us. How do we respond when we go through trials, especially after obeying God? A lot of times, uh, we imagine ourselves to be these faithful Christians. We we have we daydream, we fantasize about how obedient we are to God. You know, like, God, if you're going to call me to do this or to do that, I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey. I'm going to do everything the way you want me to. And then we finally get there and the trials come and then the temptation to compromise begins. How do we respond? This quarantine is kind of like a famine in a way. It's not very, very bad like before, but it can be for different people. How do we respond? For some, 
it's quarantine, desperate times, call for desperate measures. So maybe some people, some Christians, uh, they shack up with their boyfriends and girlfriends. Others, worse, they shack up with unbelievers. Or, you know, some couples who are married, they didn't really uh, hang out a lot because of their jobs. But because of this quarantine, they're forced to hang out with each other more. And maybe they've got some dynamics that are unhealthy or unbiblical in the marriage. And those get exposed. Others become so desperate for job, job security, work. So they start cheating, lying. They steal from companies and etc. And even Christians get tempted to do these things. Sometimes we obey God and then when we're in the middle of obeying God, we bail. So some examples. Um, we've been praying for a marriage, for example, for this marriage to finally happen, to work out. And finally you get married and then with the first trial that enters into the marriage, people bail. Others pray for a job. Give me this job, God. Give me this career. They finally get the career and then they get persecuted at work. They bail. Others call uh, want God to call them into the mission field. They want to go abroad, maybe do some work here or there. And then the gospel isn't really spreading the way they imagined it, the way they fantasize it to be. They bail. They want to go home. They're like, oh, I'm not called to be a missionary or whatever it is. A lot of times when we obey God, we go straight into trial instead of all the fantastic blessings that we imagined in our minds. Our problems increase because we follow God. Why? First, God's ways are against the world's ways. So we're going against the natural, sin-filled, fallen world. Secondly, there's spiritual warfare. The devil and his demons, they don't want us to obey God. So of course, they're going to war against us and our obedience and our mission work for the Lord. And so our obedience will lead us straight into trials and into temptations. James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. James never says, if you face trials. James says, when. So it's expected. He says, whenever we face trials, we consider it pure joy. Peter, when he was talking about persecution in 1 Peter 4 verse 12, he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. We're supposed to expect these trials. And so how are we supposed to respond and how should we not respond? What did Abraham do? Verse 11, When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a, a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. So if you really think about it, guys, this is the original bro zone. So Abraham basically bro zoned his wife or sister zoned his wife. And this lying is a pattern that we see in the life of Abraham. He does it again later on. Uh, in Genesis 20, verse 2, with Abimelech. Okay, and this is an, a character flaw that God is exposing in his life. Now, before we continue, we have to ask, what character issues, character flaws, show up in our lives when we go through trials? Is it lying like Abraham? Do we lie to get out of a, a bad situation? Do we, do we use white lies? And remember, white lies are still lies, okay? So, do we lie? Do we show anger? Do we explode in anger? Do we become defensive in an ungodly way? Do we show impatience? Do we lash out? Do we show that we have distrust towards God or anxiety towards the situation when God says, do not be anxious, but in anything, uh, we have, we're supposed to uh, pray and go to God, but instead we go to our anxiety and then we imagine the worst? What do we do? What character flaws is God trying to expose in us during trials? Because remember this, whatever character flaws that we do not get rid of in our lives, it will hurt God, it will hurt ourselves, and it will hurt others. And we have no idea how far this can go. For the sake of, of argument, look at Abraham's life and his generation. Generational attributes are even learned. Isaac, who's Abraham's son, and then Jacob, Abraham's grandson, and then Jacob's children, and then Abraham's great-grandchildren all learn this lying trait. They all learn it. Here's the thing. John 15 verses 1 to 2, this is Jesus talking. 
He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Notice, Jesus doesn't say that those fruit-bearing branches, he's going to leave alone and he's going to make those fruit-bearing branches comfortable and nice. No, no, no. We've only got two choices. Either we don't bear fruit and we're burned in the fire or we do bear fruit and get pruned. So it's either fire or pruning. Of course, obviously, pruning is the better uh, option. But there's no option for the comfortable, happy, uh, zero trial kind of life. There's no option for that. Now, look what happens next. Genesis 12 verse 14. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princess of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. Now, what happened here? Now, essentially, Abram had a kind of white lie, kind of technical lie. Because Abraham and Sarai were half brother, half sister. So it's not a, a a real, real, like a full lie. But Abraham's intention was still to deceive for selfish reasons. To save himself, uh, he, he compromised his integrity. He did not act with bravery or courage. Uh, he, he allowed uh, a deception to happen for his sake, for a selfish reason. Okay? And there's a, a context to this. You see, saying that he was the brother gave him the right to negotiate with whoever wanted to marry Sarai. Because without a father, the oldest brother, the, the, the oldest brother or the head son would have the right to negotiation. So negotiations would probably have a process and it would probably be kind of long and this would have given Abraham maybe time to, to plan a, an escape or a plan to get out of Egypt or something like that. Any regular Egyptian would have to negotiate with Abraham. And that's probably what he was thinking. You know, like, you know, uh, my wife is really pretty and they're going to negotiate with me. What he did not count on was for the people to talk about Sarah to the Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, he was not any ordinary Egyptian. He was king. He was considered a divine being or a god or a small god, capital G, for them. And so there would be no negotiations. They would just take her straight to Pharaoh's harem. And that is something that Abraham probably did not expect. And you see, that's the thing about sin. Sin always has a way of outsmarting our own sinfulness. Okay, again, sin will always have a way of outsmarting our own sinfulness. We always think, I can calculate my sin, I'm not going to get caught, or I know this sin, I know it's got this, this, and this consequences, and I'm willing to pay those consequences. But sin will always make us pay more than we were willing to pay. It will always push us farther than we were willing to go. It will always, always, always outsmart us. Okay, so we just have to believe that. This was a disastrous situation for both Abraham or Abram and his wife Sarai or Sarah. And this also endangered the promised seed that God promised to Abraham. Because remember, God said, I will give you a seed. And so now Sarah or Sarai is being brought into the harem of Pharaoh to be his wife. So, of course, he became rich and all of that. In fact, uh, female donkeys were more com controllable and dependable. So they were very, very expensive. Uh, and camels also, note it's plural. This was something that was given only to the rich. They were a rarity in Egypt. They were a symbol of prestige during that time. So camels before would have been the BMWs uh, of today or something like that or a Ferrari or a sports car or a luxury car. So Abraham became extremely rich. Now, people think, oh, so if I disobey God, I get blessed. Well, not necessarily because remember later on as we continue in the story, all these riches are going to cause so many problems for Abraham and Lot that they had to separate because of all the wealth they had acquired. And uh, this kind of wealth produced a lot of problems for Abram or Abraham. Okay, so this was not a blessing. This was not like God, this wasn't God rewarding Abraham for disobedience. This is the deceitfulness of sin looking like it's a blessing, but it's a curse. And many times that's what happens even with Christians. There are ungodly desires 
and we start praying for these desires and it's not God who answers, but it's the devil who answers. And then we try to receive those quote unquote blessings, but actually they are traps of the devil. And then we get ensnared by them. And that's something we have to remember. That's something we have to put in our minds to always think, what is this decision that I want? To do what is this desire that i am desiring right now is it godly will this lead me more towards god and christ and loving jesus or is this going to lead me away from christ now what happened next genesis 12 verse 17 the lord afflicted pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of sarai abram's wife so god extends grace god protects his own promise what did god promise god promised that Sarai would bear Abram a son, a seed. And it's going to be a biological seed. So God made sure that nothing would happen between Sarai and uh, Pharaoh. So the next thing we see here is God's undeserved or ill-deserved grace. And so while Sarah was in the Pharaoh uh, Pharaoh's harem, God afflicts everyone with a kind of disease. And so we, uh, a lot of scholars believe this was some kind of skin disease, something that's visible, something you can see that's evident. And here's what's, what probably happened. Everyone had a disease, the skin disease, except Sarai. And because of that, they would probably talk to Sarai. They would probably start going, what in the world is happening? How come we all have this except you? Something's up. Something's fishy. The divine gods are punishing us for something. And they must have questioned Sarai about this. So obviously, what's going to happen is Sarai probably would spill the beans, all right, and would confess would talk about her real relationship with abraham and so genesis 12 18 happens pharaoh called abraham or, or abram and said what is this you have done to me why did you not tell me that she was your wife why did you say she is my sister so that i took her for my wife now then here is your wife take her and go and pharaoh gave men orders concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had now, this is, I think, one of the most painful, embarrassing, humiliating, heartbreaking uh, stories of the Bible. And, and there's a reason why. And we have to put ourselves in his shoes. Because here, we see Pharaoh, an unbeliever, who is behaving more righteously than the father of the faith. Here we see a pagan God-hater who is behaving in a more righteous way than a supposed saint. This is where it really, really hurts. This is where we're supposed to cover our faces in shame when we also dishonor God in front of the world. You see, in a sense, Pharaoh was able to discern everything that was uh, happening and his disdain for Abraham was so great that in the original Hebrew, he only said four words. He said, hear, wife, take, leave. In other words, it was so rushed. It was so disgusting for him that he just, he quickly pushed them all away without even wanting to get back his riches, without even wanting to get back whatever gifts he gave. He was so, and, and we've, we've experienced that in, in some ways, right? In our, our own lives. When we're so disgusted by something, we don't care about the emotional investment we we put in it. We no longer care about how much we uh, we were excited about certain things or whatever. We just want to get that thing out of our sight because of disgust, because of disdain. Now imagine an unbeliever so disgusted by our sin as Christians that they want us Christians out of their sight. Now I understand if we preach the gospel and by our by no offense on our own, but purely because of the offensive nature of the gospel to the world, that they're disgusted and they would shun us. And that's perfectly fine. But imagine an unbeliever so disgusted by Christians because of the Christian's behavior that it's the non-Christian who found the Christian's behavior disgusting. That should cause us so much, I don't know, some kind of guilt, remorse, shame that, that should cause us to cover our faces and go to God and repent of our sin and beg God for forgiveness and for us to, to in some way redeem 
our, or for God to redeem our testimony because it's so hard for us to redeem our own testimony. It's, that's close to impossible. That We need God's supernatural intervention to redeem our testimony for our sake and for His own glory. And in this text, what could Abraham say? What, what could he have done? Nothing. He lost his witness. He stained his integrity. He stained his testimony. He stained his story. This is why Peter in 1 Peter 2 verses 11 and 12 says this. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And so Peter is saying, when they accuse us, they should only be able to accuse us of the gospel, of faithfully preaching the gospel to the point that the natural offensive nature of the gospel is what offends them, but not our behavior, not how we conduct ourselves, and not how we uh, treat them in ungodly ways. This is something that all believers and all Christians should really think of. I'm reminded of the, the text in Corinthians when Paul says that there's this um, this man who had his his mother's uh, his father's wife and he said this is something that not even the pagans uh, consider good or acceptable so he's saying how dare people profess christ and yet live so brazenly ungodly that even non-christians would say that that's not acceptable and yet it's the professing christian who does it this is something that's supposed to um uh, in in a sense make our jaws drop to the floor it's supposed to be something that would cause us um, to cringe, to go, ugh, and to grind our teeth. And we have to examine ourselves. We have to go back to ourselves. And, and again, this is kind of like a devotional sermon. So we have to go back to our own lives, our own testimonies, think of our own character flaws, and ask ourselves, Lord, what character flaws do I have that you're pruning? Because you said, Lord, that if I obey you, and, and if I'm fruitful, then you will prune me. So if we obey God, we must immediately expect trials as a means to prune us of character flaws. So we have to ask, God, what are my character flaws? It's quarantine right now. It's a trial. It's a situation that's difficult. It's a desperate uh, situation or environment that we're in right now. Okay, what are my character flaws? How are you pruning me? How can I repent? How can I be more sanctified for your glory and help me, Lord? Give me your grace to do so. That's a prayer that I, I pray that every single person um, would, would have or every Christian would pray that we would examine ourselves during this time of quarantine. And I know it's extended quarantine. It's so difficult. We cannot really fellowship very well. Uh, online fellowships are feeling more and more lacking and more and more painful. But we also have to always remember that it's a way to sanctify us. And one thing about sanctification, we must always remember the, pr the pruning process will always hurt us first. It will hurt. Then it will hollow us. Then after that, it will heal us. Finally, it will produce holiness. And that's something we all hope for. And that's the last H. That holiness is our hope. That's something that we all hope for. That's something that we all want to have in our lives. It's the sanctifying grace that prunes us so that we become more and more holy for the glory of God. God bless you. Stay safe. Seek Christ. Keep your eyes on Him and Him alone.